U.S. businesses lose $47.6 billion annually in lost productivity because 20% of U.S. workers miss an extra 10 days of work unplanned every year. So who is this fifth of the population who's missing work? Well, it's those workers who are struggling with their mental health. On this episode, Otis and I talk about the mental health crisis in our country and what that economic impact looks like. Depending on your age and your personal experience of mental health problems, you may have some very strong opinions on this subject. So Otis and I dive into this problem and untangle some of the differing views between our two generations. If you want your team to be happy and for your business to be successful, then you need to understand these different views. Because 40% of workers say that their work has a negative impact on their mental health rather than a positive. Self-actualization comes from living with intention and working towards a meaningful goal. So what does that mean for you as a leader in your business? Why does identification of the problem lead to complacency and sometimes justification? And how does historical perspective shed light on the current crisis we're facing? Otis and I dive into all this and much more on this powerful episode. Quick reminder to rate, review, and subscribe to the show wherever you're listening. You can also find the full videos of the show on our YouTube page. And if you learned something from Otis or me in our conversation, make sure to share this episode with someone else so they can learn it too. This episode is brought to you by Tribe and Purpose. The transition from college to that first career is a difficult one, and it's even harder when you lose your sense of identity. If you're an athlete who just hung up the cleats, it's hard to go from being a rugby player to being Joe in accounting. We created Next is Best to help retired college athletes use their skills to create an impact through entrepreneurship. Next is Best by Know Your Tribe will help you to smoothen that rough transition by helping you establish a clear sense of purpose, an actionable path to success, and the tools you need to manage your life. Your 20s are a confusing and chaotic time. Next is Best gives you the tools you need to make sense of the chaos and make this next chapter of your life the best one yet. You can learn more about Next is Best by Know Your Tribe at findyourpurpose.coach. That's findyourpurpose.coach. Now, here's Cam and Otis with the show. Hey, welcome to the Cam and Otis show. On this episode, Camden and I are going to dive into employee mental health. Now, uh... I'll try not to go drill sergeant on this and uh, tell you to quit your whining and because there, there is some truth to it, right? And, and I don't mean to say that facetiously because there is truth to this. And I just have a, when it gets to me, I have a hard time of whiny butts. It's like do something about it. Uh, mm-hmm. But if you don't know how to do something about it, if you don't know how to handle it, uh, it can be a very, it can be detrimental to your life. And, and, and truthfully, I think, uh, this also falls into, uh, validation, if you will, of, of something that I talk about with all my clients is there's no such thing as work life balance because work life balance would denote two separate things in your life. Mm-hmm. And last time I checked folks, we only got one life. And that's the one you're living right now. It ain't work and life. It's all life. And if it sucks at work, it's going to suck in life. So exactly. Tell, tell us what's going on. What, what do the, the Gallup folks, the people who run around and ask questions that I ignore mm-hmm. when they stop me in the street, <laughs> uh, I, I, I used to be used to be one of those they, when they try to stop me in the shopping mall. I ignored them back then too, but nowadays yeah. it, I ignore them on the street too in the phone calls. <laughs> so, but what what statistics say about uh, mental health in the workplace? Yeah, so uh, I think the first stat uh, that I think we could start off with is just in their poll, the Gallup poll, they found that uh, one in five, so about twenty percent of U.S. workers rate their mental health as poor to fair. <laughs> And that's significant because uh, when you examine the people who uh, who are in the survey at the different mental health ratings, there's different rates at which that they miss work unexpectedly. And so for the folks that fall into that group of the poor to fair mental health, they wind up missing 12 days un- uh, unplanned per year, which is about 10 days more than the average person. And that adds up to a whopping $47.6 billion in lost productivity in U.S. businesses. So it's one of those, it, when you hear one-fifth and you think poor to fair, and uh, and kind of going back to your drill sergeant thing, I think there is a good place here to have a little bit of the drill sergeant get the generational perspectives on this because uh, it's an important dialogue. But I think that number really shows 
the effects that it has. Not even just talking to the person and the mental health themselves and their happiness and those type of things. But even if you're not fully buying in on that, you know, you're old school and you're like, eh, anxiety, whatever. There is a there is an economic effect that happens, and that is something that you know. Even if you're not fully buying into it, if you're losing millions of dollars because your employees aren't coming because they're so anxious about work and they are so depressed they can't get out of bed some mornings, then you are going to have a negative impact on your business. And so it comes down to then it's like okay, what can you do as the leader to help this out? And I think one of the really interesting things they talk about uh, in that survey is they talk about the net effect that that work has. And I think it's really interesting because it goes to something we talk about all the time, which is, you know, the concept of finding your purpose and working towards your purpose. Um, completely butchering it. So I'm not even going to I'm saying his name because it comes from Viktor Frankl, but it, I'm completely butchering this. But it's, you know, man doesn't need a uh, tensionless state. What he needs is to strive for something meaningful. Right. Mm-hmm. And that can be work in a lot of ways to your generation generations past that always was work uh to the younger generation i think there's a little bit of a question of that of it just being work you know we talk about the uh work for 30 years get your golden watch and retire type of thing there's different perspectives on that but if you are having that net negative effect then you're going to get all the things we've talked about the quiet quitting the great resignation all of these things whatever labels you want to put on this stuff it's all going to go back to are they enjoying themselves at work are they happy at work because if you think about your work and your team and working towards one common purpose as a unit then if they're not seeing themselves in that purpose and it has a negative effect that's bad for your business and then the other end of that you know the flip side of the coin there is that if they do have that positive effect on their mental health. It's because they see the purpose inside of the business and they see them contributing to a larger thing than themselves. And I think that's the really important distinction there is how much of it goes back to do they see themselves as something bigger than themselves or are they just a cog in the wheel and they hate their job? Well, and I think there's a, there's a deeper root cause that it's going through the motions in life. And when we're just going through the motions in life and showing up and reacting, the only reason you go to work is because you're going to work to get a paycheck. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you don't have a, a vision for who you want to be, if you're out of control, if you're in reaction mode in life, you've lost control, you don't know what's next, you just show up and react, you can't be happy. If you're not living with intention and intention, meaning, you know, you plan ahead, you have things Mm -hmm. to look forward to that draw you to those actions, whether it's something on Friday night or Saturday morning, and you just got to get through the week, that's still living with intention. Mm -hmm. But if you're going through the motions and just showing up at work and then go home and you you know, trudge in at home and there's nothing that just that you look forward to. That's something Mm -hmm. that's for yourself. Then you know what? Yeah. You're going to, it's going to, life is going to suck. There's no other way of putting it and how you handle it and how you put a label on it. And I, Mm -hmm. I want to say something about this also is, is part of it. And one of the things that our mind wants to do is label things. We want Mm -hmm. to identify items, problems, so that we can say, yep, it's that reason. Almost in a justification mode, if you will. Mm -hmm. And and there there's there's true there's good points and bad points to that. You know, the good points is okay, well, there's the problem. I have this problem. I have a mental, I've, I've been identified with a mental health problem and I'm not even going to get into uh, medical issues and here's a pill to fix it because they don't work. They just hide symptoms. But Are you saying that there was a study that came out within the last month that said that 60% of antidepressants that were on the market were found to be ineffective in long-term studies? Is that what you're hinting at, Dad? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm hinting oh. at. Oh, okay. And Sorry. if you read the, read the side effects on antidepressants, what do they say? May cause, may, may uh, uh, how did they word it? Uh, ideas or ideations of suicide. Wait a second here. Boom. God <laughs> damn, what motherfuckers. You're fighting. Pardon, pardon me. <laughs> 
But I, you know, I'm going full on jewels on this uh, because you know, God damn. Yeah. You know, uh, as a matter of fact, I think I just caught a, a sound bite uh, from uh, uh, Tim Kennedy. It's not him talking. It was a lady talking, and I didn't didn't have time to check the source, or didn't take the time to check the source. But it was talking about big pharma and how big pharma all their their stuff call, has all these side effects, and then you take more drugs to handle the side effects. Yep. Well, that's what these antidepressants do. If we don't know the tools, and I'm giving you some tools right here, folks. I'm talking about some processes and tools in this to get out of the muck. If you don't know the tools, guess what? You're going to have to keep taking a pill. And yep. you know what our bodies do when we take a pill? They start to get used to it. Mm -hmm. Then guess what you got to do? You got to take a pill and a half. Then you got to take two pills. And it goes on and on until... You're seeking out some bad stuff. Thank you very much, Big Pharma, U.S. medical system. Get to the root of the problem. I always say this, get to the root of the problem, no matter what we're talking about, whether it's mental health or a problem in your business. Get to the root of the problem. And if you don't know how to fix it, seek out how to fix it. Don't put a Band-Aid on a sucking chest wound mm -hmm. because it don't work. Yeah, right? even if you change the Band-Aid every day. <laughs> well, you put a Band-Aid on a sucking chest wound, the guy's going to die. Yeah, well, there we go. Right. Um, but I think I think one one big piece there is, you know, you talked about the justification, the identification of the problem. And I think that is a really important thing. You know, there, uh, you know, I kind of hinted at like the generational gaps in these. You know, when you look at these numbers and you go to past studies of mental health, you know, let's just say anxiety and depression, uh, to keep it in kind of a tighter area because it is such a wide net. You know, we... Uh, Hell, we talked about it yesterday's podcast, or I guess this comes, sorry, I'm speaking from the future, Wednesday's podcast, <laughs> but the, uh, we, we talked about the shadow syndromes and how it's like, when you really start to look at these things and you really start to study them, it's, there's such a wide spectrum for so many of these different things that most people are feeling. It's kind of like, I made the comparison to a client the other day of uh, back pain. Like, I know you probably got told the same thing by a doctor that, well, Otis, well, Camden, you know, 60% uh, or something like that of people have bulging discs in their back and they don't have any pain symptoms. And then there's the other percent that do and they have nerve problems like you and I have had and all these different things. Like there's, that's a interesting stat for it, but it doesn't mean that there's no point in the identification process and those type of things, right? It's still important to understand that, uh, you know, it's most, most Americans have sleep problems. Doesn't mean you shouldn't work on your sleep problems, right? Whether it's mild or whether it's severe. And I think the, uh, the way you put out the justification, I think is a really interesting thing because to me, it's the identification. And then if you use it as a justification, then you're setting yourself up down a bad road. Because you should understand what's going on with it, whether I mean, so I uh, would have been, you know, nearly three years ago, I went to therapy for a while and they talked to me about my anxiety and depression, these things that I was going through. I, I never put a name to what I was going through. And so having the name for it gave me something to fight against. You know, it makes me think of a uh, gesture into my bookshelf, which is below camera in the new studio, uh, but of the, uh, not the art of war, the war of art. And he talks about resistance. Just giving resistance a name is the biggest thing. When you read through resistance, like for, for me with, uh, with having that identified in myself of the anxiety and depression, going through there, I was like, oh, it's just resistance. Same thing. And giving it an identity is an important thing to start your movement forward. But then you still need to be purposeful with your movement forward, which is what you were talking about. It's not just a justification. You know, my, my favorite joke of this, and I think people are getting better about it, but as the... I almost call it like mental health fad of like, it's, it's an important thing and we're trying to address it. But then it, of course, anything that you try to address as an entire country becomes a fad and becomes stupid in so many different ways. Like there's so much of that BS that goes with it. Right. Uh, but I always compare it's the, Oh, sorry, I can't do that because I have this. I can't do that. I have this. If you're never looking to make any steps forward and you're never trying to address the root problems like you're talking about, then it's the equivalent of the, uh, you know, astrology. Sorry, I'm not a bitch. I'm just a Gemini. No, 
you're still you could still be a better person oh like i and you know whether it's trauma whether it's anxiety whether these different things are you still have your individual responsibility to address those things and to move forward because the op- the other option is what you're talking about living in reaction mode and it's just going to get worse and worse and worse and it looks different for every person that's why i make that shadow syndrome point because it looks so different for every single person but you still need to be addressing. You still need to be identifying and moving forward on it, not just using it as a form of justification for why you're missing work. You know, if you're missing the 12 days unplanned per year and you are legitimately having an anxiety attack, you can't get off the floor. Okay. But if you have the mild anxiety on the other end of the sh- you know, the, uh, the other end of the spectrum and you're using that as an excuse to not address the root feelings there, which are that you're not working towards your purpose, that you don't feel connected to those around you, that you don't have meaningful relationships, then it's going to create that negative spiral rather than giving you a path forward. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you said a lot of things and I got a lot of, here, here it is. I got a lot of triggers out of those things. Uh, <laughs> One of them, one of them I, that, you know, back to the root of the problem, <coughs> pardon me, back to the root of the problem, you know, Second Amendment guns. We talk about taking guns off the street, but it's people who are doing things with a device, a tool that is doing the damage. Mm-hmm. So instead of, and this is mental health also, by the way, these these nutcases that go into whether it's a school or a mall or an office, whatever, and shoot people up, whether it's with the, you know, an AR-15, a, a hunting rifle, whatever it is. That fucking crossbow in Montana last year. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but the fuck sticks got a mental problem. Mm-hmm. And nobody is doing anything about that root cause to fix it. As as we were talking, you know, and and the identification of the mental health, it reminded me, I just had a conversation with some friends of mine, uh, you know, just a little bit before we jumped on the show, a couple of uh, veterans that I, I like to, I like to hang out with and talk. And we were chatting about gumbo and gluten and all that sort of stuff. And, and, you know, one of the comments was, you know, this gluten intolerance, it's been around for a long time, Mm -hmm. but we never knew what it was, what caused it. Mm -hmm. People that had it, they just had bad episodes every so often. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew it was because they ingested something that they're allergic to. So now there's a label to it and you can prevent it. So there's a physical action that we've, identified that that is very very widely known now Mm -hmm. mental health needs to go into that same realm people have been butt ass crazy for a long time yeah now we understand that being butt ass crazy you know crazy bob down at the end of the corner well there's a reason that crazy bob is down at the end of the corner and has some things going Mm -hmm. on so why don't we work towards helping crazy bob Fix yeah. it. I'm not talking about crazy Bob that's selling the mattresses or raise, or, or, or the used <laughs> cars. I'm, I'm talking about the, the one who actually has some mental health problems. Right. Although there's some debate about crazy Bob that's selling used <laughs> cars, you know. But Don't get into used car salesmen. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but all seriousness in this fact of when we, can, when we identify a problem, we can, we can use that as an excuse or we can use it as a path to fix something. When we identify and define a problem, the reason you do that is so you can fix it. Project Management 101, right? Define yep. the problem. Define the problem. Also, you know, military decision making process also. Mm-hmm. Define the problem. Therefore, I can create a plan to develop a solution to cure the problem, to mitigate the problem in some cases, but to put it into a box. And you mentioned something earlier also that the identification <clears throat> of the problem, putting a label on it. You know, one of the techniques uh, I learned uh, as a coach, as a life coach, this technique was 
when you had we call them gremlins gremlins are the mm-hmm. you know the voice inside your head that says you ain't smart enough tall enough fast enough good looking enough you don't deserve it all those sort of gremlin voices that are chirping in your ears well what we one of the techniques we learned was quite literally that you identify it you give that gremlin a name and then you attack it and you destroy it we actually had mm-hmm. physic created a physical model for that gremlin, whatever it may be, you know, bricks and two by fours, what something that you use to your imagination to create a physical representation of the mo- of this gremlin, of this problem that was holding you back, mm-hmm. and then physically destroyed it. How's that for the impediment to action becomes the action? Think mm-hmm. about that. When you attack, when you identify the problem, what's my problem? What's, what's the mental health? Why am I feeling this way? I identify why I'm feeling this way. I can choose to attack that thing, the root cause of the problem. If I want to, if I choose because we are humans and we get the choice, the opportunity to choose, and there's a lot bigger aspect to that also, but we get to choose what we do with the information that we have. And if I've collected the information or be handed the information by a counselor, uh, a therapist, a shrink, whatever, I get to choose. Do I want to fix it or do I want to take a pill for it? I got an ache in my knee. I got an ache in my back. Do I want to fix it? through exercise, improving posture, improving my diet, all of these sort of things? Do I want to take a pill for it and hide it? Or do I just want to walk around and complain about it? Because when I complain about it, I get attention. Mm-hmm. This episode is brought to you by Tribe and Purpose. If you're a college athlete who just hung up the cleats and you're looking to make an impact as an entrepreneur, then Next is Best by Know Your Tribe is perfect for you. Get a clear sense of purpose and a path to success so that you can make a bigger impact and make this next chapter of your life the best one yet. Learn more today at findyourpurpose.coach. That's findyourpurpose.coach. Now let's get back to the show. And before I I bitch and moan too much more. (laughs) You know, I think there's one interesting thing there when you talk about like, you know, what's the choice when you get diagnosed, but you know, where's the leg, the back, you know, whatever, uh, whatever it is that you're dealing with that you have that choice moving forward. And I think there's an interesting thing there I just wanted to add, which is the the medicine to get over the hump is also an important thing. And that looks different for all these different ailments that we're talking about. You know, we start off in mental health. We're also using physical health because also, especially especially for the sake of more so the storytelling aspect and defining the problem, I think it's useful to to use that. But uh, it's one thing uh, that's really interesting with certain with certain drugs that are so effective for people is it's. Uh, I can think back to uh, my freshman year of college here when I got uh, not strep throat because I didn't test positive for strep throat, but I had everything but strep throat apparently. But they gave me, uh, uh, I think it was Percocet for my Mm. strep throat, which was really weird because I had broken my ankle about four months before and did not get any Percocet for that. They told me to go home and take Advil. Now, it not even getting into the perspective on the opium stuff because I was right at the heat of it, which is scary looking back on. But more so, I was on the Percocet for three days and I slept in the dorm and I didn't move and I could eat and I could drink. And then I was out after that because it got over the hump and then I was able to move on from there. And I think there's an interesting thing that goes into that as well. You know, without getting into all the pharmacology and stuff, you and I, neither of us know all the different pharmacology of these things. But it's of whether you're going to use that as a crutch Uh, or no, let's take the literal crutch as the example. It'd be easy. Uh, so you have the crutch because you hurt your leg. Are you going to do the PT or are you going to lean on the crutch? Are you going to keep working to get rid of the crutch? Are you going to use it less and less every day because you're doing your exercises or are you going to keep leaning on it? And that's, that's really the choice that I think we keep talking about is what kind of path do you want to take forward? Because there's a whole spectrum of paths that you could take, but it's whether or not you're going to take that action or are you going to be the victim inside of it and just use it as a justification? And one thing I want to talk about, uh, I, want, I want to make a point on is you know, use the gluten intolerance example. I, I love that example because uh, it's one thing I was reading a uh, story last night about a old actor. It's a wonderful life. Jimmy, 
Jimmy Stewart. Stewart. Mm-hmm. Jimmy, Jimmy Stewart, Stewart ser- served in World War II, and mm-hmm. he got uh, discharged. He was diagnosed with flak syndrome because he was freaking out about getting shot by anti-aircraft guns. That's PTSD. They didn't call it that, but that's what it was. And, you know, uh, World War I, they always talk about thousand-yard stare. These are things that were not identified. As we're identifying them, I think there's this interesting thing where, you know, like I, like I said about these stats, that if you go back 20 years, it's like instead of 20% of people, it'll say 5%. It'll say, you know, 8%, whatever it is. Because people weren't aware of it. There's more of a stigma around it so people aren't talking about these things. Uh, but then also it's the identification is different. You know, it's, it, you know, uh, not that you've ever done this, but I'm going to throw this at you because you're the representative of your generation right now. But it's like the, I have depression. No, you got suck it up syndrome. Suck it up, kid. Like, no, no, no. Like, okay, that might be what you think it was. And that might be what it was when you were growing up. But we can still look at it differently. And I think that's a really important thing. Bring it back to the workplace. Because generally speaking, the people who are going to be uh, identifying more with this data and the people who are going to be answering this data, this is another one of the stats, is trends towards younger and it trends towards female. And I think a big piece of that is just the openness of the dialogue there. Uh, this is self-reported data. The, you know, if you know your statistics on the self-reported data, that means that it's more than 20%. You can, you can bet your bottom dollar it's more than 20% of people that, are, that have these issues. Uh, a lot of people are going to put fair to check the box because even though they're in poor or very poor, right? And those things are really important because when you start to look at the workplace, who generally is going to be your boss now? It's going to be somebody from an older generation. Who generally is going to be the employee who's struggling with this? Someone from the younger generation. So the dialogue that we're having talking about these two different generational perspectives is really important for that because that's who's dealing with this, right? Unless you're only hiring people in your demographic, you're going to be dealing with these differences in views. And so it's important that you're able to identify those differences and still uh, still find that path forward. You know, uh, without ranting too much, I just want to say one more thing on that. There's, uh, there's a phrase I love, and it's a philosophy of, uh, I always give credit to Sturgill Simpson because he's how I found the word because he has the album, Metamodern Sounds and Country Music. And I was like, what the hell is metamodern? I looked it up and it's metamodernism is a philosophy. And it basically goes, as you go through the different philosophies, they're always rejecting the previous one. What I love about metamodernism is that it says, no, conservatism has this right. Traditionalism has this right. Modernism has this right. Postmodernism has this right. Modernism also got this wrong. So did traditionalism. And like all these different things. And how it's like, okay, we're in freaking 2022, about to be 2023. We are not smart enough to look back and tease out which things are right and which things aren't. Because when somebody from your generation goes, suck it up. What you're really meaning is fight, keep fighting. And that's a good thing. Saying suck it up, get better is not a good thing. But the intention behind it is, right? The uh, people in my generation who are using it as a justification, their intention behind that is pure. They're coming from a place of it's like, I want to fix this thing, but I don't know how to fix this thing. But they're not taking the action. And so that's why I want to bring the metamodernism things. It's literally two different generational perspectives. And both of them have the logic behind it. And both of them make sense. But if you're not going to be able to weave those together, you're not going to be able to create a good path forward, especially if you're in a business that has multiple generations inside of it. Yeah. Well, uh, you just reminded me, and uh, kind of going back this meta modernism, uh, something Neil deGrasse Tyson said on uh, Joe Rogan's podcast a week or so ago, whenever that was, fairly recently. And I thought this was really interesting because Joe was, uh, you know, talking about well, you know, the Big Bang theory, and now this dark matter theory, and that does that to negate the Big Bang theory? And as only uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson could could do, uh, he weaved this whole thing Mm -hmm. to educate. And he educated me on that. And what he said was in science, and and by the way, he used Newton and Einstein and the theory of relativity. I'm not going to go there uh, and try to explain it. But basically what he said is in science, as we continue to discover more, it doesn't negate laws like Newton's law. It doesn't negate it, but we understand better what the parameters are of yes. it. And I think that's such an interesting thing when you think about, we could talk about mental health. Like I mentioned, you know, crazy Bob, there's been a crazy Bob standing on the corner, you know, since man 
stand, st- started standing on corners, right? Since we started to have society. <laughs> if since you we will. invented corners. Since, since we invented corners, right? And then we've had crazy Bob. You know, it may mm-hmm. have been crazy Julius, crazy as Caesar, all of those sort of things. But they've always existed. What we have now is a better understanding of why it exists. Mm-hmm. And it goes back to that understanding. When we have that understanding, we can identify the problem. Which leads me to something you said about the the likely uh, demographic of the people who replied to uh, the survey, this Gallup survey. Sorry, just to correct on that, just because since we're talking stats, not the people who were apply, or replying, the people who replied that specific way with the yeah. with the yeah. mental health. Yeah, just okay, Got just it. make it sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes sense because one of the things that my generation has done for your generation is help you understand self awareness, become more self aware. And even to the point of fault of I'm so important, uh, I'm very important yeah. person, right? Uh, well, yeah, well, we have to be part of an organization and team sidebar there. Mm-hmm. But that self-awareness has enabled us to go, oh, this job sucks and it doesn't have my life doesn't have to suck. This isn't what it has to be. That's the difference. People have been doing sucky, shitty jobs since jobs were invented, since people started farming. You know, guess what? Back in the caveman days, you had to go out and hunt. And it still might have sucked to go out and hunt when it was cold and crappy weather. I don't Mm -hmm. care how many furs you got on. It still sucks sometimes. Mm Mm-hmm. But now we have this self-awareness of this and realize, I think here, here's, here's why it's become a mental health issue is because we have this realization that my life doesn't have to suck. Yeah. You know, 60 years ago, that's what our culture said. You go to school until you're 18 years old, you get a job until you retire. And you do that job until you retire. Your job, your life purpose is to get a job and work and a paycheck, procreate in a house, get a gold watch, retire and die. That was life. Now, now we have better understanding of us as individuals. And the problem happens in this mental health is we realize wow, this does suck, but how do I unsuck this? Mm -hmm. And that's where the problem happens. I think that's where, and I'm not talking about the, the uh, chemical imbalances and things like that of of true mental health. I'm talking about my life sucks. I'm in this situation that sucks and I don't know how to fix it. I just know it sucks and it's going to continue to suck. But geez, look at all those people or Kardashians that are, you know, their life is so wonderful because I'm watching them on the TV, you know, two times a week or every night or whatever it is and following them on social media of how wonderful everybody else's life is and mine sucks. So, of course, I'm going to feel like crap yeah, and realize that my life sucks and feel sorry for myself and have anxiety to that because I think this is all there is. Mm -hmm. I think that my life sucks. Everybody else is living a wonderful life. And I don't know how to get out of this other than it just sucks. And I'm drained every day because when we're in that mode of life's sucking, we believe our life sucks. Mm -hmm. That's physically draining. You are exhausted at the end of the day. All you want to do is sleep it away. You want to, curl up under the covers and in this weird sort of way, think that by sleeping in this state that you're going to open up the covers and it's going to be better. Mm -hmm. It's a weird sort of way that our mind does that to us. And that belief is crippling. 
and spiraling to make it worse. No, totally. And, you know, it makes me think of is, uh, and I don't know if I'm coining this phrase or not, but it was what I wrote down when you were talking, which is the self-fulfilling prophecy of comparison. That if you're comparing yourself to somebody, then, and you start to think, oh, my life sucks. The more you do that comparison, the more your life's going to suck. The more you look outward for that affirmation, the more you're going to feel negative about what you do have. And I think it goes into, one, it creates that negative spiral. But then also, I think, you know, talking to the caveman and the different, you know, uh, the different really natural things that are going on. Because it's always natural. That's the thing. It's inside your brain. It's natural. This is evolution. It's all these different things. Uh, the These, um, we talk about the lack of purpose. And you talk about, you know, the caveman and these different things. The re- one of the main reasons that you don't see the mental health crisis and even just take modern days in developing countries as much is because you don't got freaking time because you got to go put food on the table. And as soon as you get a few more of those creature comforts and you don't have to fight for your life all the time, then you can start thinking about what you were saying earlier of the self-awareness and learning that and those type of things. And that's not a bad thing. It's the natural, I mean, fairly, I would say that's a natural progression of society that as you get more time, you know, it's the, uh, it's the division of labor. I don't have to spend time, you know, building a house because I can pay someone to build my house. Now I can t- spend time thinking about something else. And like you said, we want to think about happiness. We want to think about purpose and these type of things. And so naturally we're going to drift that way. And it's, I think it really goes back to like when we look in like the past, like the PTSD example with World War One and World War Two and like those type of things, we didn't take the time to identify these things. And now we are and maybe this is you know this is a little bit of the optimist in me but it's maybe it is the time to put these things together and try to start to solve actually some of these problems not just shake your finger out and go oh everyone's anxious everyone's depressed you know the sleep thing no one can sleep in america freaking fix it and that those things take time you know when we're talking about uh one thing we've talked about a bunch on the show before is like behavior as a coping mechanism, how whatever environment you in, you're in, you wind up with a coping mechanism that is literally your behavior. Uh, I've been told by people, this is why I laugh in awkward situations because I was the youngest and I was trying to diffuse the fights between the siblings or whatever it was. Like I was just, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. We should go back to watching TV and ignore the problem. Like that's the coping mechanism that's developed. That's part of my behavior. These things happen generationally too. As much as it's it's so funny when we get into the mental health conversation, the people who take it to like the generational fight, because it's like, no, y'all did this. We're doing something too, and we're going to mess up the next generation in some way. Y'all messed us up in a, in a certain way, and you guys got messed up in your way. Like that's kind of just how behavior goes. It's going to continue to go that way. And the, on, the only hope for it is to continue to address things and to keep moving forward on it and to have those real dialogues. Uh, there was a movie that came out. Uh, what a... <laughs> I wanted to say Spider-Man. It, it's not Spider-Man. It's Spider, Spider-Lab or something. It was, a, it was a weird movie on Netflix. It's pretty good. They The concept is basically it's all these criminals that sign up for this drug program and they're testing drugs on them. And it's, a, it's a trippy, weird movie. Pretty good. But uh, the main guy is one of the Hemsworths. And he makes this joke to the guy. And he's like, oh, classic millennial this. And the guy gets really pissed at him. He's like, I'm sorry. Generational comments are literally like horoscope comments, except a casting a wider net onto a bigger group of people and putting them all into the same bucket. There's no point for it, right? So I think that's an important piece when you have these conversations. Throw out the freaking generational buckets. Those perspectives all exist. We talk about the metamodernism. Those things all exist, and they're an important piece of the conversation, but you can't use those as layers of assumptions to solve the problem. You have to use them as pieces of information to solve the problem, and I think that's a big difference there. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I'll go back to something that's, uh, you know, a fundamental belief. And I I mentioned it earlier, and that's taking charge of your life. Uh, You you can't, you cannot be in charge of your life when you are a victim. When everything is woe is me, I screw everything up, everything and everybody are against me. When you're in that mode, you, you cannot fix yourself. Now, you know, the Dave Ramsey methodology is change. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. Yes, Dave, thank you very much for the double clap. I love that. But there's a lot of truth to that, too, because when we mm-hmm. decide to change and we decide to take action to live with intention, We decide to take action to pursue our purpose. Well, Otis, I don't have a purpose. Well, God damn it, you do. 
You just haven't figured it, it yet. You just haven't hey, defined it yet. To the clap, clap, go do something about it. Pick one. Move towards yeah. the target. Maybe it won't be yeah. the purpose. Maybe you could go find something else afterwards. But you got to start moving at some point. Yeah. Right? Would you? Would you rather live your life sitting on your ass, feeling sorry for yourself, or risking pursuing something that's not your purpose? Hmm. There's your there's your deep thought for the day. Mm-hmm. If you choose to pursue something that you believe today is your purpose, wouldn't it be better to do that and then to figure out that maybe it's not and then choose something else? Guess who's in charge when you choose something else? You're living with intention in pursuit of your purpose, even if it's the wrong purpose. Yep. You're pursuing it. And when you're pursuing yeah. your purpose, you're moving to achieve your own success. But Otis, I don't know what success looks like. Take a guess. Mm-hmm. Take a guess. It's better than than wallowing around, woe is me. The top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is self-fulfillment. And you said this already, Camden. The reason these things are coming together and becoming more known is not just because of how my generation taught your generation, but it's because we've moved so high up, literally high up in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Cause that thing still exists. It's what 80, mm-hmm. 80, 90 years old when he had to find it, uh, or however long ago he, he did 80 or 90 years ago. It still is accurate and as the bottom of the period, food and safety, uh, those sort of things, psychological, personal needs, being part of something, because misery loves company. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're all wandering around, wallowing around, feeling sorry for each other, uh, feeling sorry for ourselves together. That top piece, that high, highest level in Maslow's hierarchy needs self-fulfillment. Your whole life will change if you start to live that way. So, man, uh, I want to I want to wrap this up with with that thought of of Maslow and and what I learned. And you know, uh, I think uh, you know tying back to the the War of Art. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I got it right. Okay. I started to think. <laughs> Every time. I Every know. Time. We, we've messed it up so many times that when I get it right, I'm like, wait a, wait a second. Is, it, is that right? Uh, but, but naming it, naming the resistance, the same thing I was talking about with the gremlin. It's such a great thing because when you name it and you know what the impediment is, then the way becomes the impediment or the impediment becomes the way, right? Mm-hmm. The obstacle is the way go through the obstacle, attack it, and overcome it. That's success in life. Camden, how about you? What did you learn? Yeah, uh, actually, in the the same kind of vein, you said this earlier, identification as an excuse or a path forward, that you get to make that choice. The identification is an important process. It's also an an indifferent part of the process. The difference comes from what you choose to do after you make that identification. And I think that is such an important thing when we start talking about mental health and just taking control of your own life and, you know, living with purpose. I think that is such a key thing. Um, before we before we go into the outro, though, I, I do. We're talking mental health. I have to make, mention, uh, you know, everyone's favorite depressed horse. I'd kick myself uh, if I didn't. But it's Bojack Horseman. There's two quotes from the show that I think paint the two different perspectives people want to have on it. Right. One comes from the depressed horse, Bojack, and uh, somebody tells him, you're responsible for your own happiness. And he goes, I can't even be responsible for my own practice. How am I supposed to be responsible for my happiness, right? That's the fear of it. And it speaks to the hierarchy of needs, that if you're not building those, then it's even harder to make the jump to that top one. Uh, But then there's one from another character that I think is much more positive in a way. And what it is, is it takes you a really long time to realize how unhappy you are. And then it takes you even longer to realize that it doesn't have to be that way. Mm-hmm. And that's what you're talking about of taking that action is once you realize it doesn't have to be that way, you can take action. And I think that's a pretty good positive note to end on today, Dad. Oh, love it. Love it. All right, Kim, run us out. 
All right, thank you all for listening to this episode of the Cam and Otis Show. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to pass it along to someone else so they can enjoy it too. Follow the Cam and Otis Show on Facebook and Instagram. Full videos of the show are available on YouTube, and the full archive of our episodes is available at www.caminotisshow.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you all.